Yake Tsutat. Good morning. Leka Klenach Mide Dua Yuchat Dua Sak, Shingit Klenach, Zetsinak Yuchat Dua Sak, Nanya Ina Chatsati, Kachadi Yeri Chatiti, Stakin Kwan Echat. If you've ever met a Klinkit, that's the shortest way we can say hi. Um, <laughs> uh, if you hear me say, you know, Donna Iwak, it's please give me your eyes, but everybody here is very attentive, and I hear that we have folks from 10 countries here. Hole, good job. <laughs> so we have wonderful speakers here today, and the purpose is bridging uh, indigenous and Western ways of knowing regarding our ungulates. It's important so that we can face the challenges and know how to build meaningful relationships and partnerships that blend different knowledge streams and importances. And I love the way that the organizers worked with this and were thoughtful and intentional about viewing our ungulates as not just a species to be under a microscope, but as relatives, and how do we incorporate story and that living relationship that's extended well over 10,000 years. This plenary will feature a group of experts, experts here, I'll introduce them in a second, and we're going to look at you know, management, policy, research, and we're also going to have a discussion. So the first few minutes is for them to introduce their programs and themselves, and then we're going to go into a, a dialogue. And because um, we want to do this a little bit different than just a, a panel session, they're going to choose which questions that they want to answer and um, talk about on stage. So we have plenty of time for that. So unfortunately, Elmer Steetote Jr. from the Western Arctic Caribou Herd Working Group and Chief Roland Wilson from the West Moberly First Nations had a last minute conflict and they will not be able to be here with us today. But we do have Naomi Owens Beek from the Soto First Nations who has graciously joined us today on this panel in Chief Wilson's place. We also have with us Jim Dow uh, from the um, Alaska, the Department of Fish and Game. Hello, Jim. Thank you for being here. And he's flying solo, so he gets plenty of, of talking space. Uh, we also have with us Amanda Dimund from Kalkaluktuk Ungnu Niatit. Ah. And we also have Andrea Hank from University of Calgary with us today. Thank you. Um, we have Naomi, as we mentioned earlier, from the Soto First Nations, and we'll be co-presenting and discussing with also Scott McNay, uh, Wildlife Informatics. And then we also have Jean Polfus with Canadian Wildlife Services, and Shelley Kalio from Kelly Lake Cree Nations. Gunshish, thank you for being with us here today. And I'm sure, or at least I hope you have heard every morning that we are on Denaina Eshnana, and we give gratitude to the peoples of this area from the Aklutna tribe who have been here and lived here for since time immemorial. And we are grateful to be able to live, work, play, and be in this beautiful st space and connect with the ancestors. So, Gnashish Chinan to our relatives. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our speakers to discuss their programs. And they have about five minutes per each group, and they've self-organized who gets to speak. So I'm just here basically to be entertaining. <laughs> All right. So Jim, uh, can we please pass the microphone to Jim? If you would please introduce your project. Am I on? Sounds like. Okay, thank you very much. If I don't stick to my notes, I'm going to be an honorary member of the next plenary, so sorry I'm going to read these notes. But. <laughs> anyway, during 1970 through 1976, the Western Arctic herd plummeted from 242,000 caribou down to 75,000 caribou. Unfortunately, the 1976 population estimate was released with reports from biologists of widespread uh, waste of caribou by subsistence users. Thus began one of the most contentious wildlife management issues in Alaska's history. 
The mutual distrust between agency staff and subsistence users in Northwest Alaska went beyond the Western Arctic herd. It affected management of all wildlife in Northwest Alaska, and it quickly became a statewide issue. These were hard times for people who depended on caribou for food and also for wildlife managers in Northwest Alaska. Change gears. During 1977 through 1988, I was lucky enough to work with the reindeer industry on Alaska Seward Peninsula. This provided me lots of time out in the country with Inupiaq reindeer herders. So by the time I uh, hired on as a wildlife biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in 1988, no one had to convince me that Inupiaq people had a deep understanding of the land and animals where they'd lived for millennia, or that we needed to incorporate that in information into this complex dance that we call wildlife management. Luckily, around 1976, the Western Arctic herd went from an 18% average annual rate of decline to 13% annual growth, and that growth persisted for about 15 years. Not surprisingly, around 1993, when we realized the herd had stabilized, our regional staff began, began thinking about how to prevent a replay of the management meltdown that happened back in the 1970s. In 1995, Fish and Game sponsored a conference to discuss harvest management of fish and wildlife in rural Alaska. During the conference, a resident of Consibue, where I live, pressed John Cody, who was our regional supervisor at the time, to consider government-to-government -government management of the Western Arctic herd between indigenous tribes within the herd's range and the four state and federal agencies that were managing up there. It was perfect timing, and the benefits of working closely with local residents who were overwhelmingly native uh, before our crisis developed were clear. So John agreed to investigate a co-management approach for this herd. What followed was a three to five year process to assess public interest and agency support for co-managing the Western Arctic herd, and to decide whether agencies and users could find a mutually acceptable co-management structure and process to work toward. Staff attorneys quickly informed each of the four agencies that they had no authority to share or delegate their legal mandates to manage Alaska's resources with any other entities, including tribes. So for the better, of the better part of the next year, co-management of the Western Arctic herd literally hung by a thread. Uh, fortunately, uh, well, eventually, the individuals who were pushing for uh, legal parity for tribes accepted that that could not happen in the legal context we had then, and they stopped attending the meetings, unfortunately. But the remaining participants proceeded to form an advisory group to the State Board of Game, the Federal Subsistence Board, and individual agencies in the interest of long-term conservation of this herd and all people who use and value it. It was agreed that the working group would consist of a broad spectrum of users, but subsistence users would hold the majority of the voting chairs. I've been away from the working group now for about seven years, ever since I retired. But in retrospect, the one thing I think that every individual in our initial group of representatives did, absolutely right, was to come to the table with an open mind and perhaps grudgingly for some, risk developing trust among groups that had fostered mutual antipathy for about 20 years by that time. Trust was the essential ingredient necessary for the formation and effectiveness of the working group. In 2003, eight years after the idea of a working group was first raised outside of a public bathroom during a conference about a completely different topic, the Western Arctic Herd Working Group took on its first official, official task, and that was to revise Fish and Game's 1984 Western Arctic Herd Management Plan. The working group has uh, updated this plan twice since that time. Although the working group has absolutely no legal authority for anything, when it can reach consensus on an issue or policy, it's an influential body by virtue of its um, wide represent representation of users. There's a number of people at this conference who are affiliated with the Western Arctic Herd Working Group. In the front row down here, we have John Trent. He was absolutely critical in forming the working group from its very beginning. We've got Vern Cleveland, he's the chair of the group right now. Tom Gray and Tim Fullman, they're all voting chairs on the working group. 
And there's probably other people here I haven't seen as well that, that, are, that could be voting chairs. Uh, Kyle Jolly, Alex Hansen, and probably a number of other biologists here uh, are agency staff that support the working group. They're here. If I could, could everybody who is affiliated with the Western Arctic Herd Worker Group now or in the past, could you please stand up so people can see who you are? If you have questions about anything about co-management of the Western Arctic Herd, you can hit me up or hit any of these guys up or hit all of us up. Most of these people are very nice and they're not bashful. Thank you. Don't actually hit them, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, so next we have Amanda and Andrea, who are going to um, introduce themselves as a team and their project as a team. Hello. Can this working? Yes? Yeah, just hold it close. <coughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I will be kicking us off. Our, our partnership, anyway. My name is Andrea Hankey, and my pronouns are they, them. I am a PhD student at the University of Calgary with Dr. Susan Coots. I started this as a master's program in 2017, and I was coming from a background of outdoor recreation and natural science. I really had no idea about the Arctic or about caribou. Actually, I was quite confused at the beginning, being there are dolphin in the Arctic? But <laughs> no, it's we work on the dolphin and union caribou herd. So I spent a lot of time reading, listening to people, learning about caribou, and thinking about what good and respectful research is. I'm queer and non-binary, so it was very, very clear to me that I needed to think systemically about research or what's going on deeper, what's informing the information that I was learning. So the first time I went to Nunavut or to Kukluktuk was in November 2017. Another student in Susan's lab, Matilda Tomaselli, she was just finishing her work in Ika Tutiak or Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. And one piece of that work was doing interviews with Inuit harvesters and other local knowledge holders about muskoxen. She had been using these participatory activities to create semi-quantitative results, like relative abundance trends about how many muskoxen people were seeing over time and how that changed. So the idea for my work was to try these participatory activities in a different location, in Kagluktuk, about the dolphin union caribou herd. Around the same time, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada had reassessed the Dolphin Union caribou herd, and they recommended them as endangered. So that's really what kicked off our work together. There was interest from the academic side to try these methods in a different location. There was interest from the community to document more traditional knowledge about the herd. And there is interest from co-management to have more Inuit knowledge available for their deliberations on the dolphin union caribou. So since that start, we've done a lot of work together from a series of interviews and workshops, presenting at a lot of different co-management meetings, at academic conferences together, and at community meetings. And I think we work pretty hard to do some good research for the caribou and for the community. Uh, thank you, Amanda Dumont, manager for the Kogluktuk Hunters and Trappers Organization. I'm a hunter, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. And I was raised on the land, so my parents taught me the importance of showing respect to our land and our animals, and it is deeply instilled in me. So I'm passing that on to my son. And that commitment and that respect, I see it in him already. So when Andrea first came up to Kogluktok, I was, had just recently started my position as well. And I was kind of wondering, okay, what am I doing here? I had no idea really what I was doing. Um, and But we had built such an amazing relationship, our community, our organization, with Susan Coots and her team. So we were able to build on that. And I think that was probably the most important part of this project because we were able to move forward. There was trust between um, the 
the research group and trust from the community, which was the key. And because of that trust, our, our knowledge holders were able to share their information. Since I started in 2017, it's always been um, really important for me to have traditional knowledge or community knowledge incorporated into any research that we see. And also because we, when, we, when our co-management partners are making a decision, we need to have that incorporated as well. Because there's information in there from our elders, from our knowledge holders that science can answer. Mm -hmm. And we see that the other way. There's, there's gaps and knowledge that science can fill in. And my dad, at one of these meetings, he said, oh, without your research, we would not have known that. And without our history, you could, have not, you could not have taken that into account. So it was so amazing to hear that and so amazing to, to move forward with this project. And it's continued today. We are six years later and we're seeing such a shift in different um, groups, different uh, co-management groups, different decision-making bodies where they're taking traditional knowledge um, almost at the same level as Western science. And I think that's so important to have both of them um, included. Thank you. Ganeshchish, thank you. All right, next we have Naomi Owens Beek and Scott McNay, who will introduce their project. All right, thank you very much. Um, thanks to all the uh, conference organizers and the audience here for this great opportunity to be able to talk about how um, we've been able to braid and share knowledge, knowledge systems between Naomi and Soto First Nations and uh, myself as a so-called Western scientist, I guess. <laughs> um, we, we, we braided this knowledge together to, uh, to help um, recover a, a small caribou herd in, in British Columbia, North Central British Columbia. When we started, that, that herd was only about 16 animals, and the adjacent herd had gone to zero. And so the First Nations communities wanted to get together to do something about this uh, disaster, really. Um, and uh, we took some activities on the ground, which I'll uh, explain in a moment. But at the moment, uh, the herd's been, uh, for the last 10 years, has been growing at 14% per year and is now uh, up from 16 to uh, uh, a whopping 132. <laughs> Those numbers pale in comparison to what Jim was talking about here, but uh, we think that's an amazing uh, progress for our part of the world, and, and we're uh, really um, looking forward to what the future might bring there. So I know the uh, storytelling session is tonight, but I have to tell you a little story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, my first North American caribou workshop was the sixth one in 1984, Prince George, so approximately 30 years ago. Um, uh, Tom Bergerud gave, uh, the late Tom Bergerud gave his talk there at that conference, which is now a seminal paper on the demography of caribou, asking that telling question, have we got it right yet? If Tom were here today, I think he'd be very disappointed in the state of most caribou herds, in British Columbia at least anyway. Uh, but at the same time, I think he would be very encouraged and very excited about um, how many uh, First Nations communities have stepped up to the plate and actually taken control of trying to recover caribou populations in their traditional territories. And this is one example. It's, uh, it's something that I've been very, very proud to be part of. Um, obviously, you know, uh, as I said, that conference was 30 years ago. My career is 40 years deep now, and I'll take this experience with uh, Soto and West Mobley First Nations as a as a huge thing back into my uh, into my retirement as something that I'm very proud to have accomplished. Um, I just want to review those actions then that we did take uh, starting about 10 years ago. Uh, we started with uh, wolf removal and uh, maternity penning to help avert extirpation of that one small caribou herd that we were dealing with. 
And then we um, managed to negotiate this, uh, uh, I think I'd call it unprecedented, but very important uh, agreement among the, the two First Nations, Soto and West Moberly, uh, Canada and British Columbia, to be able to protect a huge amount of country in the central group, or greater than 700 uh, hectares, uh, 700,000 hectares. Um, and there's uh, uh, going to be a, a talk on that tomorrow, I think it is, in the four deck, I think, tomorrow afternoon. So you can go and hear more details about that agreement, but it's been a very, very uh, important agreement for us. Um, and then um, <coughs> following that, we've uh, been undertaking a very, very aggressive aggressive habitat restoration program in the areas that aren't protected. Um, there was a talk yesterday afternoon, hope you took that in, but we we're hoping to restore um, pretty much the entire core range of, of at least the Kalinzi's uh, caribou herd within the next five years. Um, it's a pretty uh, ambitious target, but we we're hoping that that'll happen. And then, uh, you know, following that, we've got, a, um, we're working on a, a brand new set of very strong uh, and hope and soon to be legal uh, land use objectives uh, to to pr to pr to um, uh, uh, promote a, a, a really significant conservation ethic towards caribou in the in the non-protected lands and there's going to be a talk a more detailed talk about that this afternoon in the after deck room, I think it is, so hope you can catch that. But anyway, those are the activities that we undertook. Um, it's, uh, we're just basically trying to throw everything at this herd. Uh, like I say, it's growing, but the real long-term solutions are more in these uh, protection of habitat and the restoration of habitat. And uh, we've done all of these activities across the board um, with um, a, a strong collaboration and trying to braid the knowledge of the Indigenous communities along with the science. So hopefully uh, we'll get into that a little bit later in our panel discussion here, and I'm looking forward to that. Ah, uh, can sheesh. All right, and next we have Shelly and Jean, who will discuss their project. Um, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Oh, closer. <laughs> Hold the one, and then it should turn. Teamwork makes it happen. <laughs> At first, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous people and to allow me to um, come to their to the territory. Tense, Shelley Kalu Sagaswian, Asinawachi Neowak, Kelly Lake Cree Nation, Tante Uchinia, Musquesqueo Sagaswian, Gwemi. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Shelley Callio. I come from you from the Kelly Lake Cree Nation. Um, my Cree name is uh, Mother Bear Den, which I'm very honored to have had. Um, and I come from you from a very small community that were missed in the Treaty 8 signing. Um, we continue to be a land-based community. It was very important um, growing up, very connected to land. I come from a horse culture and I'm really thankful that, you know, I had a community that were influenced the way that I was raised and also coming from um, that language which really associates us with the land. Um, we reached out, we were reached out by Environmental Climate Change Canada on a 2014 amendment to Southern Mountain Caribou and at the time we had looked at our research and a lot of the oral testimony that we had gathered in the 1990s with a lot of our elders on their understanding of the habitat and their use of the land, the cultural use areas. And we used that those reports to really look at the analysis of their understanding of areas of high interest where the caribou were located. So when some of our work that we had done with the elders, you know, it's, um, I'm grateful for Jean Pulfis and the work that they've done in the inclusion in a lot of the workshops that we've been involved in, critical habitat language revitalization, which is so important and vital to understand the name places that connect us to language. 
You know, we come from a community that still retain their language, their culture, their way of life, and to have that understanding with our elders. Um, my role as a cultural advisor really, my background is environmental technical as well as early childhood. So, you know, I um, understanding Indigenous knowledge, there, t there has to be understanding that protocols that come into place, gathering that in knowledge takes the time and the effort to spend time with our elders and our knowledge holders to share a meal. You go in there and you pay respect. Um, show tobacco, you know, bring, um, bring a gift. Those kind of things break down the barriers in sharing the knowledge. And I can only say in the, the work that we're doing now, um, we're involved in a lot of caribou um, camera database knowledge that we're gathering. We have um, one of our knowledge holders that goes out every 10 days and collects the data and then sifts through it and looking at um, identifying the herd that is in the Bear Hole region, which is close to the Kaskatna River in our territory. And it's really important because if we don't have this analysis of that data, then we're, we won't be able to present to um, look at a lot of the impacts that are happening right now. There's oil and gas, there is the forestry that are impacting it, um, mining. To have that data in the Western science, which I've had to explain to my elders, in the non-Indigenous world, everything is data, everything is reporting. In our coming from how we approach it, it's all oral testimony. And to be able to partake in that work is a high honor. Um, to have that trust of the elders and to be able to do the work that we're doing now with um, some expression of interest funding that um, Environmental Climate Change Canada has provided for us to have a land-based uh, teaching elder knowledge um, transfer of that information based around language and identify identifying the importance and significance of the caribou. In the 1960s is when we looked at that time period when the impact from the forest came into our area. You have to understand our community was very isolated. We did not have any access to um, roads until the 1970s when Alberta uh, created a road into our community, 1980s when the BC government created um, the Heritage Highway. So we were very isolated and we were very connected to the land. And when I've heard a lot of the um, speaking today, that is what I understand how the land is. It, we refer to it in our Cree language as Wagotuin, a relationship to all living things, the mountains, the trees, the grass, the water. Everything that we do consists on food sovereignty, um, harvesting, berry picking, which we still retain. And, you know, like we're just here um, to speak on some of the work that we're doing. And as, as it goes on, we will answer as many questions as we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was great. Thank you. I'll just add just a little bit. And thank you, Shelley, for that beautiful introduction to the work we're doing. When I think about this idea of bridging and, and finding ways to bring knowledge together, I'm reminded that above my computer, I have a couple of key phrases that have resonated with me um, that try to, I try to ground my work every day. And they're enthusiasm required. And I try to come with energy to the work we do because we are so lucky to have this opportunity to work on something so meaningful. And the next one is, Think outside the box, and there's so much space outside the box to explore. And one of those, those components is thinking about when we're bridging knowledge systems, I think a lot of us consider thinking of indigenous knowledge, Western science being these outside forces um, that must be brought together, when really they're inside us. And when we, when we think about bridging knowledge, it's each individual person who has the opportunity to be that bridge. Because all of us hold within us the knowledge that we can share with each other. And by listening, 
we can be the start of that work. And what I want to give people is, is concrete examples of how you can do that every day. And so the third phrase I have above my computer is we reject the erasure of indigenous voices. And that's what we are trying to do in the recovery strategy amendment for Southern Mountain Caribou. It's have this document reflect indigenous people's long history uh, that Shelley so beautifully talked about that is connected to the land. And the first place to start is language because that is where people describe and understand their world and conceptualize the ecology and the species and find relationships. And that's easy for all of us to do, right? So learn the words for caribou in the languages from the places you go and the places you work. And put them in your documents and have them front and center before the words that colonial systems brought in. Um, in a systemic way to oppress the language, to oppress the people whose histories were there. And so our work is focused on trying to find ways to support communities, to do the work that they need to do, and to have those voices reflected in, um, in federal documents, in all the documents, and in the recovery programs that we're working on. Thank you. Ganesh Cheesh. So in Shingat, caribou is Watsik. Uh, oh, I messed up on my X. Watsik. Ganeshish. Um, so Ganeshish, Ganeshish, ach du huni. Thank you, thank you, my friends. Yake tsutak. Good job. <laughs> uh -huh. um, Andrea, when you were telling your story, I. It, and you were talking about the dolphins um, and how you're going to research them in the north. <laughs> Made me think of a, a story. So I work with the Wilderness Society with Tim Fullman. I'm the Imago Initiative Coordinator um, and Senior Specialist of Tomfoolery. And I, uh, I, I also teach at the university in various capacities. And one of them is a traditional health-based practices. And I was talking about seasonal living. And I, I started talking about how our um, porcupine herd starts to migrate you know, at the hatching of the uh, biting flies and the mosquitoes. And um, you know, I'm talking about these tacha, or mosquitoes, and, and how you know, it's so important in the season to be ready and, and knowing when things are going to hatch because of the, the snow melt. And I had this gentleman, this is behavioral health providers, they're licensed social workers, they all have degrees in some way. And he was new to the state and he says, I'm just so confused. And I was like, what's the matter? What's, what's confusing? How, how can I help you? And he says, I just, I just can't imagine porcupine traveling over the Brooks Range. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you. Yes, caribou. <laughs> Tutu. <laughs> Tutu running from the tacha. <laughs> uh, so thank you. And, and basically, you have all agree already answered this, this question that we have for the first one. But I'm just going to allow some time maybe for a little bit of a deeper dive about how these projects were initiated, you know, what enabled them to, to come about. And I, we heard about, you know, happenstance meetings in front of the restrooms and a lot of origin stories. Um, but what else, like, what's the, what's the, you know, magic there that helped to spark things in a good way? I can kick it off. <laughs> um, so really what ultimately kicked off the maternal pen discussions with the West Moberly First Nations and Soto First Nations um, was a court case. The burnt pine became extirpated, which resulted in BC having to do a plan because um, they had taken first coal to court and they won, West Moberly won this court case because that approval of a mine you know, that was the demise of the burnt pine. So that's kind of what kicked it off. And then of course there was, we could visibly see there was mismanagement occurring with caribou. Um, so we knew that 
action had to happen. And um, yeah, so that's really what initiated the start was uh, the court case mismanagement of caribou. Um, so First Nations, we felt, we almost felt obligated to assist the caribou herd. We're historically stewards of the land and we, you know, we were just implementing our rights. Um, yeah, so like, like Scott said, the, the Morberly herd was at 16 and uh, it was a really critical point for them. So I had to ask my elders, I was like, do we want to help the caribou? We, we could either help them or watch them die. It was, it was a easy decision. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I would say, listening to the other speakers, it seems like tough times, you know, often force us to work together. And it's kind of a sad commentary on how the process works. It'd be great if we could have good times and say, man, this is going great. Let's all get together and slap each other on the backs and have a beer and all that. But but the reality is it's often tough times. You know, I told the story about the Western Arctic herd decline just to say that that's what we, that was our reality for 20 years and we did not want to repeat that. We don't want to repeat it now. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're doing it right though. I think we're on the right track. I think back early in my career, I went, I actually was a member of the very first North American Caribou Workshop back in 83. I was just starting graduate school. And it was, uh, there may have been a couple of ind indigenous people there, but it was mostly biologists. It was guys with beards and flannel shirts look like me. <laughs> look around the audience now. We've got lots and lots of native folks out here and they're, they're on the panel. They're talking, they're, I think we're on the right track. And Sheesh, anybody else would like to answer? Uh, maybe just to pick up on that too, like, in our community, we have three caribou herds, and they're all on decline. So I think, you know, because they're all on decline, people want to know what's causing that. Scientists want to know what's causing that. And as caribou people, too, we want to know, are the, these caribou that we're eating, are they healthy? And, there's, and in this day of climate change, you know, we can't rely so much on our traditional knowledge because our ancestors never seen such drastic changes like this before. And I think that's where Western science can come in. We're seeing a lot more maybe diseases coming out with the permafrost melting. Mm -hmm. And you know that is an example of how Western science can answer some of these questions that I can't, my, my elders can't. And you know, like, it's been amazing watching these two different ways of knowing come together in so many different forms and ways that in my, in my work. We have, we have a few different co-management groups, and one in particular takes um, both ways of knowing, and they come up with a status of um, the population of that caribou herd. It's an amazing process to watch and an amazing process to be a part of. And, you know, it's sad, like Jim said, we're coming together at a time where our caribou numbers are so low. We need to continue to work together because we are seeing some changes in one of our herds. There is improvement, and we just need to continue to do that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, if I can add just onto that. Um, Susan, wave. <laughs> I think one thing that really helps uh, our work is that Susan's been working in community for years. And when I get questions in whatever meetings I'm in, what happens when I'm gone? Well, when I'm gone, Susan's still here. <laughs> and that provides some continuity. Con allows our programs to continue and a touchstone for all of our relationships. So when I started, everyone knew who Susan was. And I'm like, oh, I'm Susan's student. And you can kind of connect those two. And then something else that 
I think has really helped build up relationships and for me to build up relationships is we have funding for me to go back and we never uh, go forward with our results without checking in with community be like, is this right? What do we have to change? And then once we get it out, we can bring that back again, being like, okay, we did this great work together, let's celebrate. So I think those components are really important for that relationship bit. I think really when we look at it, it's, and I'll use the words of one of our elders, we're coming from 156 years of exclusion, expropriation, 120 years of silence. And to have this collaborative approach and taking some of that Indigenous knowledge, incorporating into some of the policies that are being passed through legislation, I believe that is the only way we can bridge that gap, is to understand some of the systemic wrongs that have been happening in our country, which is Canada. You know, if we can't speak on um, reconciliation, we have to have the truth, and the truth has to come from our history that connects us to the land and our relationship. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shelley. You must have done your homework because you segued us right into the next question beautifully. So thank you for that. Um, so to, to continue on that theme, you know, for the rest of the panel or for the rest of the group, what are some of the barriers that were faced in bringing various ways of knowing and how were they overcome or not? Hi, uh, yeah, okay, well, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the interesting barriers that uh, that I thought we we ran into right at, at day one was, um, I knew from a Western science perspective that we had to stop the the downward trend somehow. We had to stop that, and the best ways that I knew at that point to really get in there and do it quickly was to remove wolves first off. <clears throat> excuse me, and then second was to uh, attempt this crazy thing called maternity penny. And uh, neither of those two things were kind of the right thing to do for the communities, really. Um, you know, it's not, it's not the First Nation way, <laughs> you know, to, to go and do those kinds of things. I mean, yeah, sure, wolf trapping was always part of the culture um, and all that sort of thing, but we were doing it in a very aggressive sort of manner, much, much more aggressive than perhaps would have occurred historically. And so those were really tough decisions for the community members to, to, uh, to kind of uh, grapple with, and I know that it's still not something that's um, widely accepted uh, around the province even and so around BC at least anyway and and so for for the communities to make those decisions to say yeah okay we're gonna we're gonna embrace ourselves with these kind of Western science ideas and 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 make this happen just to be able to kind of preserve and 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 um, get ourselves in a position where the herd isn't going to go uh, isn't going to be extirpated so that was a really tough decision and a barrier um, just one more was um, permitting uh, uh, you know we as Western scientists, you know, I have to get permits to do this kind of work and uh, from the government and, and again, the communities just said, well, why do we need permits? That's just, you know, it's not, you know, we just should be able to go out and do this stuff. So it was another kind of thing that we had to kind of embrace. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Yeah, so there was a lot of, these discussions occurred over two years <clears throat> to agree on them. And one of the big discussions I remember was um, everyone was like, why are we just focusing on wolves? Because we know there's other predators out there. And so that was, um, it was hard for us to explain that to the elders because, you know, there's bears, there's cougars, there's wolverines. And so the, we had to like present it in a manner that they could understand and support it. So that was hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we've got plenty of time. All the time in the world. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Just couldn't wait to talk here. Um, 
Well, as I said earlier, there's legal barriers that, that we all face. And, and I, I think there's a real disconnect, it seems, between people like the people here. We're thinking about conservation, and we're thinking about indigenous cultures, and we're thinking about long-term you know, consequences of what's happening now and what we do. But the real, oftentimes, the, the real decision makers are politicians. And they tend to think in terms of how long it takes before the next re-election comes up. They think in the short term. They tend to think about money. Money is good. That makes people happy and it gets votes. Somehow, I think we need to get on the track with, with the decision makers, what we've been doing between indigenous people and Western scientists for a long time. We need to get politicians thinking beyond four years or even 10 years. We need to get them thinking about 20, 50 years dealing with things like climate change and clean energy and things like that. So I would say that's, that's something that, a barrier that extends way beyond this room and these people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think some of the barriers that my community faced because of the fact we were missed in the treaty signing is the fact that we're seen in BC, the province, as a non-rights bearing group. And that free and prior informed consent that should be happening, should have been happening due to the implementation of UNDRIP, the Truth and Reconciliation. And it's really on our knowledge holders and our community to take that initiative to gather that information so we can present it on some of the framework discussions that are happening so we can be the voice. And those are the barriers that we face currently in the community. Thank you. Um, and one of one of the things, so the, for Southern Mountain Caribou, there's over 150 Indigenous communities with an interest in those caribou, and at least 40 associations or institutions that represent Indigenous people. And I think what we hear repeatedly, and this comes as a surprise to likely no one, is that capacity for the communities is a huge barrier to them participating in our processes. And the capacity includes people, resources, and money. And one of the initiatives we took to start projects like the work we're doing with Kelly Lake Cree Nation is um, there's a lot of bureaucratic barriers to providing honoraria for people's time to participate in these processes through federal funding agencies or through the federal government to fund people. And we have recently, in the Canadian Wildlife Service, partnered with a national non-government organization called the Center for Indigenous and Environmental Resources. Um, and provided funding to them to act as a bit of a middleman with the money to more easily flow money to communities for smaller projects with very little um, administrative control, huge application, no huge applications, um, smaller reporting requirements so that the work can actually start getting done. And within that also we have an easier way to pay people for their time. And I think we need to remember that we really need to respect elders time and energy and they should not be providing their knowledge for free um, those of us on salary don't have to work for free and we we need to be able to do that in an efficient quick manner and we still struggle um, this is a learning process it's it's very difficult but there there have been new trying creative solutions to solve some of those barriers to people's involvement Thank you. Goodness, Cheesh. Um, can we wait just a minute? Do you want to go right now or can we wait a minute? Go ahead. I have a question. Can, hold on a second. We'll give you a microphone. Um, we're going to wait for the question from the full audience for a few minutes, but question. we're going to allow the elder to go. Um, I'm, a, I'm an elder, so I think in one term. I'm not going to wait. I, I, it's on my mind. This is how we are. Get used to it. <laughs> um, after you collect all this information and you go back to your village, do you uh, go address the elder first 
and explain it before you bring it to the public and say this is how we have come to the conclusion how this will balance what we're trying to do? Or are they given any time to look at what you're presenting back to the elders so you can get their blessing? Or you just take it and run with it? I'd like to know. Yeah. I'm definitely respecting whatever my elders have to say. Um, they're the ones with the knowledge, they're the ones that are sharing it with us, and so I, I definitely give them the space that they, they need. And if we're coming forward with a decision, yeah, definitely. We also have to run it by a chief and council, and there's layers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just I have a great quote from my uncle. He he always says, "I speak for the moose." So, yeah, yeah. Um, I would I would say uh, it, it works both ways. One of the things that we found out with the Western Arctic group, we spend all this time, you know, scientists and indigenous people and Yupak hunters and this and that, trading information. But what we learned pretty early on was that not everybody is a good ambassador back to their village. It doesn't get not only to the elders, it doesn't even get to the active hunters. But um, to counter that, I think one thing that's really good about the Western Arctic Herd is that we bring an elder in for every meeting and we have a period um, where they've got the floor and they can go for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Nobody asks an elder to be quiet. They're, they don't get 10 minutes and then you're done, like us. Um, so it, it works both ways. I think there's some good things and I think there's some bad things about involving elders, but it goes beyond elders. It goes even to active hunters. Hmm. Okay, Tim, he has a question next to her. I guess while well, you're figuring that part out, uh, for the research that we do, whether it's the traditional knowledge research or the harvest-based samples that we do, we always go back to who was involved in those studies first. So for the interviews, we'll have bring people back together in groups. So we'll have an elder group and another elder group, and then say, this is what we found, this is how we did it, and then what do we have to change, or are we wrong, or is there something else in there? And so they help us do that little check and balance. And then one thing that Juliet Dean Francesco did in our lab is she was analyzing muskox hair for their stress and then got all the sample, got all the results from that analysis and brought that back to the these groups, so elder groups and then younger harvester groups and be like, what does this mean? And helped um, create that interpretation for the, the sample results. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. Can this mic working? Yeah, just hold it close. Okay. My name is Theodore Kotchak from Stebbins, a reindeer herder owner. Mm -hmm. um, I started in 1951. I was only about six years old. Uh, wasn't aware of the caribou, but the caribou has always come to our area, so we're always afraid we we're going to lose our reindeer, and at times we lost some of our reindeer from the caribou and the wolf. One thing I find out, starting when they were about four or five hundred thousand caribou in the western Arctic caribou herd, there were packs of wolf. They would come behind the caribou herd, 50 in a pack, and you could see in at times that width of the uh, wolf pack would be around 50 feet wide, like maybe. And I met, I, yesterday I uh, spoke a little bit about that, the caribou and the wolf. The wolf and the caribou are our enemies, but um, you know, that's as far as it goes. Um, so uh, we've, we've lost Reindeer, many times with the caribou. Uh, Stebbins house, I always heard, have a herd. And most of the time, they would have 15 to 17 reindeer herders out in the country between Stebbins and Anvik 
Lake and Stebbins Unicreek, Stebbins and St. Mary's Mountain Village, all those. I consider that area to be, at my guess is about nine million acres. So we have uh, feral caribou that stays local and we have reindeer, but caribou hasn't come to our area that much. They trickle down south from uh, west of uh, uh, Caltech, uh, uh, Nulado. So they filter down to our area now. And my guess is that the reason why the caribou declined so quickly was because those packs of wolves, they followed the caribou herd. That's my conclusion, that mm -hmm. how the herd declined to what is now today. Thank you for sharing. Um, as you were speaking about the wolves, I was thinking about that because some of our elders back home in southeast with our uh, deer and, and moose populations, they get prohibited from traditional hunting practices of wolves. And then there's the decline in the evangelates. Um, and so, you know, when we start doing our traditional practices, it comes back into balance. So I, I was thinking about that in my head too, like, you know, those laws and policies and and how they swing us out of balance and then we have to work so hard to get back in into balance. Um, so thank you for sharing with us. And our next our next question for our group on the up here is talking about the benefits. Um, actually, we already did some of this, you know, but what are some of the like maybe surprise benefits out of this work that you experienced? What are some things that you weren't intentionally thinking that were happening, but were a good outcome um, in the process or at the end? All I have to I do is wiggle my eyebrows at her <laughs> and she picks up her microphone <laughs> on it. <laughs> um, well, we started discussions in 2012, and in 2020 was when our Caribou Partnership Agreement was signed. So that was not expected. And I feel that was an achievement that BC and Canada recognized that Soto and West Moberly and Wildlife Infometrics, like we worked hard for, I don't know, eight years or whatever it was. And so to have the recognition of, hey, look what they're doing, we should go to them for advice. And, and it kind of just snowballed from there, I guess. And then we have the amazing benefits of, uh, of the agreement outcome. So we have a guardian program, we have um, good money for restoration, and it's just amazing that we were able to, I didn't, I didn't imagine that happening, so it was pretty awesome, yeah. yeah. The trickle down from that is that the uh, partnership agreement and the protection that, that it offers um, puts us in a place where we can actually go ahead with a very aggressive restoration program and not have to worry about future uh, undoing of that work. So that was an unexpected benefit that uh, I think we, we had there. And I just, one more little quick one is, and, and I don't know whether people get this or not, but the, uh, the, Expediency part of recovering caribou uh, has is really important to the First Nations. It's all about um, being able to not lose the culture and the connection with caribou. Uh, we were down to 16. It's a very, very slow process to build a population when you start with 16. <laughs> and uh, uh, so expediency became a, a, a strong word in the agreement and the uh, shared recovery objective of that partnership agreement. And the thing that what I want to tie the loop back to the uh, um, uh, surprising ben outcome was that that expediency word is huge. It, it really puts us in a place where we can really be aggressive in terms of recovering caribou, and I think that's what we need. So it was just a surprise to me anyway, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, maybe not really a surprise, but just a, an acknowledgement of the work that we're doing, that, and it needs to continue. 
And we're seeing that today. We are. We're continuing these relationships with various organizations, and we're seeing it in decision-making pro, uh, processes. Um, for our, all of our caribou around my community, you need um, a tag to hunt. And for, for people who harvested without them for many years, it's still such an issue. To me, it, it's still really, really hard. You know, like we were out hunt, um, on our spring camp one time, and we hadn't seen caribou in this area for a number of years because the numbers were so low. And lo and behold, we're traveling, just driving around, and there's this caribou there. And my 18-year-old niece said, oh, we should, we should hunt it because that was a traditional practice. And I, I was like, I take, taken aback a little bit. I said, we can't. We don't have a tag. And as a hunter, you know, all I thought of was like, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, we would have. And we would have show, showed my niece um, all the different regular cultural practices at that time of the year. And I actually cried, explaining to her why we can harvest it, but also explaining to her why we're doing this. We want our caribou to come back, so we're going to sacrifice a little bit. And she understood me. And, you know, we're continuing on these dialogues with, with our people, with our collaborators, and it is amazing to see this process continuing to happen because if we want our caribou to come back, we need to continue to do that. Thank you. I just want to answer back to the elder that directed the question. Um, I just have to say that as my role as a cultural advisor and some of the work that we're partaking on, I was raised with old traditional values. As a young person, we were not allowed to even be in the same room when an elder was speaking to, um, you know, to another elder. So we, we were raised with those awarenesses that, that respect is high. And right now, currently, with the work, we've had like um, a meeting with some of the elders and had a discussion on how important the value is on hearing those voices to be heard. And with really the surprising thing, um, you know, like for our work, is that um, nobody is speaking for the caribou on the land in our community until we do the work. So they, they need to have that voice. And I think with the work that we're doing and really in the high insistence on some of those oral testimonies from our elders, if you don't do the work, we have to protect the land. And that is what we're trying to ensure in our community, in our land base, that we have a sustainability of um, our, our animals that are there, right? Thank you. I guess for me, um, two surprises that I saw. Um, first of all, at the working group meetings, um, I was really surprised. I, I didn't know that I'd ever see this. I, w I wasn't surprised that we figured out how to bridge the state and federal regulatory systems or you know, include indigenous people and elders and this and that. That's, those were the goals of our getting together. But I wasn't sure that I would ever really see these groups that had been at odds for so long actually respect each other. And so in the working group, it's been really a nice surprise to see ardent urban hunters maybe mildly disagreeing or maybe even strongly disagreeing with, with native users, but they do it very respectfully. It's never hurtful. And the other best thing, the best surprise I saw was the willingness of all users, indigenous subsistence hunters, urban hunters, everybody, they're rallying around caribou, the western Arctic herd. Everybody is willing to do what it takes, and we've heard over and over that they support restricting themselves. I didn't know that I'd ever see that in my career. In the early days, in the 70s, when it was so bad, it was, it's your fault. And that's, that's not the case now. So that's been a really nice surprise. Thank you, Jim. Um, 
So we have, Tim, we have a gentleman third row in with the black cat. Who wants? Next aisle. Aisle three, Tim Fullman, aisle three. So, Tim, you, you didn't think I'd let these guys get away without talking. Uh, my name is Tom Gray. I'm the head of the reindeer industry in Alaska. And um, I sit on the Western Arctic Care Board working group. I'm on the executive committee. Um, Jim Dow and I have bucked heads. We've had coffee. We've done it all. So, but uh, I'm going to throw something out that um, that I hope the feds and the state is listening. Um, I I'm the head of the reindeer industry on the Seward Peninsula. Uh, I'm just guessing 90% of the reindeer disappeared because of the caribou. The caribou came in, we had no idea that they were coming, and boom, they were gone. Now, when you go back in history, the reindeer industry started back in 1900 or something. It grew to 500,000 animals in Alaska. Then it crashed, um, and we were at 25,000 animals on the Seward Peninsula for a long, long, long time. And in the meantime, the caribou herd grew to 500,000 animals. And it's crashed. Now we're at about 165,000 animals. And, uh, you know, there's these cycles that we all flow through. And you talk about the land, and, uh, you know, we're all about it. I'm, I'm a, a, a hunter from a village, uh, White Mountain. I spent 30 years in White Mountain with a reindeer herd, and I was the kingpin that supplied meat for that town. And, <clears throat> and now we have new kingpins. You know, I'm getting, I'm pushing 70, so I'm getting slowing down a little bit. But Ted Kachak got up and spoke a few minutes ago. Him and his par partners are loaning me 250 reindeer next year. And I'm going to start a herd again. Yeah. But the, what I'm chasing here is somehow we need to reevaluate our, our partners in this co-management of animals. And, you know, we've let the reindeer industry at the table to a certain point. But we're a big, if you look in the DNA of caribou in Alaska, of the Western Arctic caribou herd and the herd up by Barrow, in the DNA you're going to see reindeer. Reindeer in that DNA. And we've had impacts on the caribou herd. We need to be at the table and be partners. And, and we need to know where these animals are, when they're coming, if they're going to impact us. We have to run and hide, um, on and on. But again, uh, you know, we're an industry that's not going to go away. We've been around for 100 years, and, and we're feeding people just like the caribou herd is. And, and it's so important for us to survive just for our native people. You know, I'm, I'm native. Just for our native people, we need this industry to survive. And, um, but, but being at the table and working out the, the issues, um, that is so, so important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for sharing with us, and, and I'm sure most of you know what is meant by the caribou taking the reindeer, but just if we have students or somebody who's not familiar, it's as the herd passes, the reindeer join the caribou herd and then take off and um, you know live in the wild. So that's what's meant by that. Um, and I just wanted to clarify because I had to learn that early on as well. Like, what? <laughs> of course they want to run away with caribou. It makes perfect sense. Um, so that is a, definitely a challenge. So thank you for sharing. 
Okay, so we actually have about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to ask for the people on the stage any last thoughts that they want to share, or questions for each other maybe even, and then we'll go to the rest of the audience for um, questions. Tim and Heather will have microphones, and they will go to you, so you don't have to use your river voice. Um, just hold the microphone real close, and so, but first I want to ask our our friends up here, um, like I said, is there anything you'd like to add or if you'd like to respond? Um, or is there questions that you have for each other? I, I saw the eyebrows. I was trying not to and, <laughs> and it happened. I, I just, I want to add that um, I think a good outcome from this agreement with between the First Nations, BC and Canada, is the great collaborations and partnerships that we formed. And I don't think, like, we all supported each other and we needed each other at a critical time. And it was just, it, I felt it was so important to be working together. Um, and that's my biggest takeaway is the collaborations and partnerships that were formed amongst three governments mm. who don't gel very well. At, at times, so it was pretty pretty good. Thank you. Did you? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, the I don't want to be negative, but the, you know we we're just getting started here, and we've got a long way to go. Uh, again, 132 caribou. We've got thousands and thousands of kilometers of road to restore. Um, but uh, I'm very optimistic that, uh, that this is going to take us along uh, uh, into the future there in a good way with Caribou. Uh, I guess, no, you are. Oh, oh they have one, they'll pass. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Here it is. Take two. Oh. <laughs> ah. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up is I work with Amanda in Kugluktuk, but I also do work in some other communities, Ula Hoktuk and Iklaktutiak or Cambridge Bay. And the the way that I work in each community is different because they're different people. And one thing I find surprising that seems to be a disconnect with other folks that I talk to, other researchers, is that like this work is people first. Like you make you work with one person and you figure out how to work together and then you work with another person and it's slightly different because they're different people. And that you can't just like cut and paste your methods from one community to another to another because it just it it won't work. Like you need to have your work be community based and build up from there. So for the Dolphin Union caribou herd, what adds an extra complexity or an extra boundary is that one of they're in two different territories. So two communities are in Nunavut and then the Ula Huktuk is in Northwest Territories. There's two different land claims and there's different processes to go through. So that's an extra thing that we have to work together and figure out like the boards aren't actually parallel. The co-management on one side doesn't mirror what's happening on the other side. So that's just another thing that you have to just work people first. I think really in terms of... Oh, oh we can't hear you. Uh, come Hello? Up. Is it red dots? Yeah, that's a red dot. Could, could one more time on bottom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think really when you look at that um, collaboration on different platforms when you're speaking on caribou recovery, I know my nation is involved with a recovery strategy in Jasper National Park as well, a maternity pen that's been developed, passed through um, in some of the park management work we do with other nations. Um, I think there's a total of four different nations. And I think that collaborative approach where we look at the historical content and how we moved fluidity through trade negotiations and our intermarriages that existed 
when we all coexisted on the land before the expropriation happened, but working together now on ways of coming together and sharing ideas is really, um, I think that's going to be so beneficial when we look at our past um, historical reference and then working together on these approaches, people that have currently caribou on their land bases to provide analysis on some of the nations that may, may not be on land bases that have caribou. And as well as working on different, um, we also work like on a little smoky caribou um, round table to have those talks with other First Nations and respect the values that they're each bringing on, I think that is the most beneficial to hear other nations work. And that is why I'm so um, lucky to have the role that I am to speak to back to my people on the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so earlier I said Watsik, and we started out with Hande i Wak. So give me your eyes. So we're going to do something really quick. I'm going to say hande i guk, give me your ears. And so for your traditional word for caribou, can you share it with us? And if you would like to practice, now's a good time for each one of what you, your traditional word for caribou. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Check, check. <laughs> um, so in Cree, it's Atik, and then in Daneza, it's Wadzi. Wadzi. Oh, that's uh, cool. Daneza, Wadzi. Yeah. Anisa. It's the Dene. Dene has other names, they just get them. Get is the other name. Oh, but th that's the words for my community. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're just going to go with the one term we use for caribou is duktu, but there are, because we have different caribou herds, um, they all have different names for where they go to, and I, I don't want to get them mixed up, so I'm just going to say duktu. Again, because we're Cree, it would be atik or atik wak, which means many. Atik wak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I don't know why I'm trying to pass. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I recognize that as we're speaking about indigenous knowledge and we, we keep using English, so thank you for humoring me in, in that sharing. Um, so we're going to do a speed round of question and answers because we don't have a lot of time, but I'd like to hear from a few people. So if you have a question, uh, we first one right there in the red. I'm glad about the last thing you just said there about, about uh, words for, for different animals. Uh, what I've noticed uh, is that uh, where we are, and it's, I think everywhere, and it includes uh, both people with uh, Aboriginal cards in their pockets and uh, those without, um, is that, I'm going to call it tokenism, and it touches on what uh, Jean here said. So somebody will say, what's the word for this, or what's the word for that? And, uh, and they go off, and it's horribly mispronounced forever. Okay, the next thing is that if you write it down to them, okay, then uh, same thing. And uh, the problem is, is, is that uh, le uh, words, uh, letters and combinations of letters are not pronounced the same from one language to the next. And uh, a lot of people would understand it if I said if you gave a unilingual, a unilingual French person a page of English to read, it would be horrible, and, and vice versa, English uh, back to French. Okay, so what people have to start doing, otherwise it's just tokenism to ask for the word this or that, I hear it a lot and it, it, it gets on my nerves, is when you, when you want a word for this or that, then uh, pick up the pronunciation too and, and, and use it. Um, my wife, she's a first language speaker, she gets a lot of phone calls, word or phrase for this or that, then somebody goes off and they put it on the, on the name of a program, and then forever it's horribly mispronounced but they, they think they're being respectful. Well, that's being disrespectful if you don't take it to the next step. I'm gonna give you a quick example and then I'm gonna sit down. Uh, some of you have heard of the uh, Torngat National Park in northern Labrador, it's fjords and oceans and it's, uh, uh, it's the Labrador Inwood people there, the Avanimiut, which means the far, far away people, really what it means, that's the original people there. And uh, 
and then they would also, with the park, they'd say Torngat, and then they would talk about the Torngats. We're going to the Torngats. And the people with the uh, cards in their pockets and the ones without, it's all the same, just about. And well, it's not uh, Torngat, it's Dumat. And But the letters are pronounced differently, and the combination of letters. And it's not Torngats, it's Dungait. So Dungat, Dungait, not Torngat, Torngats. And on and on and on and on. It goes on forever. And nobody picks up on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Oh, we have, yep, you're on it, Tim. Hello, my name's Wayne Mercury. I'm a Metis person. I come from a Metis background. We've been in Canada since Canada was born. I know a lot of people don't know what Metis are. Um, however, I'm from North Slade Métis Alliance, and I have an issue. <clears throat> I keep hearing the solution for dealing with caribou is by calling wolves. Again, it seems that we look for the easiest and simple and fastest way to solve the decline in caribou. I don't think this is right. Uh, it wasn't done in the past. And I worry if this is the right thing due to the fact that I know we've had to introduce wolves into other areas to bring back the balance of nature. So I'd like to know from the panel what they think about, is this the right decision? Is, is it because we're just doing this quickly and it's just like, oh, everybody feels good. Look, we've killed a whole bunch of wolves and the caribou are coming back. I don't truly believe that's the right way of doing things. I, I find that most times when man gets involved with nature, we seem to destroy it instead of fixing it. Instead of letting nature take care of itself, we think, for some reason, we know better. So my question is, does the panel truly believe the best way to solve a problem is by destroying another species. I'd like to know. Thank you. Masi Joe. You said exactly what I hear from my dad, is that as, as a human, we, we interfere too much. We do. But, I mean, we also have to think on the other side, okay, we need to figure out different ways to help our caribou. You know, there was, in, in our culture, we were wolf hunters, we were wolverine hunters. And when the fur market crashed, people stopped. And so we've seen an increase in our wolf, wolf numbers. And I, I know because I've seen it. We, we have this really amazing um, wolf incentive program in, in Nunavut and in NWT. We're not taking out huge, huge numbers, but we are taking out some wolves. And I, I spend two weeks on the land um, in the fall time doing my caribou hunt. And in the last couple of years, since this wolf program started, the number of yearlings that we see now is so promising. The number of calves that we see at that time of the year is promising. So in my heart, I really believe that, you know, we need to do what we can. And this has been something that I've been um, arguing with, with our own government, because they implemented a total allowable harvest without looking at doing other things. Because you need to look at the whole picture and the government wasn't just doing that. And so in our community, we said, okay, what, what's driving this decline? Is it health? Is it habitat? Is it predators? Is it human? No, it's a combination of everything. And that's what we believe. So in our community, we've been pushing for um, looking at all these different ways um, and what can help the caribou, not just one, not just two, but as a whole. 
and and I've seen that working. Um, we have amazing sampling program for caribou and muskox. So we have a really long-term data at um, any diseases that are affecting our caribou, if it's um, in decline or if, if um, disease is increasing. So we have that amazing data that's still coming forth. And we have all this community information coming about predators, about grizzly bears, wolves, wolverine, and also like everything from the sky to the land to the water to the insects to the rodents. And when you, when you compile all that, our elders can say, okay, our, we had an enor enormous amount of ptarmigan in the last couple of years, and I heard that when these numbers come up, our caribou numbers will come too. Mm -hmm. And I see that. And so we need to continue looking at everything that's affecting our caribou and not just picking one or two to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. So we're, we're at 10, and I'm getting hand signals. Um, so what I'm going to say is we have the panel with us here today. They're not going to run away. If you have questions, please approach them um, throughout the day and, and ask them. And um, thank you for your time today. And it's so early, so make sure we all get up and stretch for the ceiling and, and have a little bit more coffee or tea, kahwe or chai. Ganesh to our panel.